I'm Tony Filipovich, a member of this congregation, serving as worship associate this morning, along with our worship leader, Susan Chambers. Our minister, Reverend Diana McLean, will be back in the pulpit on December 10th. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Mankato. All of you, whether joining us in person or on Zoom, are welcome in this time that we make sacred together. We extend an especially warm welcome to you if this is your first time here. We know and appreciate that it can be difficult to cross the threshold of a new church for the first time, whether in person or online. We humbly acknowledge that before European colonization, the Dakota people were stewards of the land on which our fellowship building sits. They teach us that the land does not belong to any of us, though it holds the history of our conflicts and of our attempts at reconciliation. And we commit to an ongoing intentional journey of humble connection with the indigenous peoples, characterized by understanding our shared history, accepting responsibility for restoration, and building relationships in the here and now. Thus, we seek to be good relatives. Sunday morning's a team effort, and I'm grateful to all of you who are, who are willing to serve. Today's pianist, Nancy Cramblett, the director of children's faith development, Macy Forsyth, will share a story in worship time. Children's Chapel will be led by Macy and Danielle Stedman. Uh, there's no nursery care today. The nursery attendant called in sick this morning. But uh, if you wish to take your child down to the nursery room and be with them, you can certainly do that. And thanks to our sound assistant, Linda Gansky, and our worship uh, tech, Kat Clements. And thanks to Denny Cramblett for taking care of hearing assistance. And to our greeters, Henry Panowich and Liz Kipp. If you are new to the fellowship, we are grateful that you are expanding the we who is us. If you are attending by Zoom today, you are welcome to stay after service and to visit together. For those attending in person, we have coffee and refreshments in the fellowship hall uh, today, thanks to Connie and Jim Rovney. We're always in need of more people to take turns in those roles that make Sunday morning possible. We're especially in need of more people to take turns in assisting Kat uh, with sound during worship. But there are many other opportunities as well. There's a clipboard on the hutch in the entryway for you to sign up for one or more ways to serve. And you can still also use the Sign Up Genius through our website. Good morning. We have just a couple of announcements today. Our theme for December will be mystery. So think about mystery and how it applies to your spiritual journey. Um, we are also participating in the sharing tree. You may have seen in the entryway the things that can be purchased and brought to our sharing tree, which is up here. Our new singing bowl has such a long echo. So together let us kindle a flame symbolizing our co-creation of sacred space at home and in this place made sacred by your love, by years of love. As you do, please write in the chat that a chalice is lit on your street and please say the words with me that are on the pew cards. We are a welcoming people of diverse beliefs who commit to broaden the mind, nurture the, nurture the earth, and build community. May this flame we kindle remind us to strive today and every day to love beyond belief. Diane Dobitz wanted to deliver the messages that we're sharing this morning. But her holiday travels conflicted with her being able to be present, and I'm the substitute. And while it's Diane's message that I'm conveying, I strongly agree with her that our pledge to recognize the many peoples who have been at this site 
before our ancestors acquired it is something we need to continually educate ourselves about so that we have a full awareness of our own backgrounds and the cultural shape of the story we learned that may not always be true. Our fourth principle of Unitarian Universalism is the free and responsible search for truth and meaning, and we are exploring that today with gratitude. Diane noted that it's a part of our pledge to honor the indigenous people who were a part of this UUFM home before we arrived. She wanted to weave together Thanksgiving and the message of Mariah Gladstone about indigenous food. Diane had just heard Mariah Gladstone speak about in Mankato for IPD. Diane noted that it hurts to know and that many do not acknowledge that the Thanksgiving myth of our nation leaves out a lot and honoring the truth helps to heal everyone. She shared the following article by Liz Schumer, which is called The True Story Behind the First Thanksgiving, and saying that the article states that for pilgrims in Native America, it wasn't all peace and harmony. She said, ah, Thanksgiving, Time to dive face first into mountains of mashed potatoes, count our blessings, and if we're feeling really ambitious, get up a friendly game of toss the pigston with the cousins or watch our favorite team do the same. But before we all descend into food comas, it's important to reflect on the real history of Thanksgiving. The first one wasn't all peace, love, and pass the gravy. While well, the settlers at Plymouth and their allies from the Wampung Nawag tribe really did get together in 1621 for a table groaning three-day feast to celebrate the settlers' first harvest, that's far from the whole story. In elementary school, most of us probably learned that English religious exiles began establishing civilization in what they called the New World winning over the local indigenous people already living there with the promise of friendship. Then, the Native Americans taught the new arrivals how to grow crops to sustain their growing society, and everybody lived happily ever after. Well, not quite. The real story is far more complicated, not to mention a lot less kid-friendly. In reality, the peace that brought the Wampognaugang and the settlers together at that historic table wasn't easy to come by, as, as, as we'd like to believe. A lot of bloodshed took place both before and after that first feast. Mistreatment of Native Americans continues to this day. That's why many Native Americans and others mark Thanksgiving as a solemn day of remembrance instead of celebration. Here's what really went down after the plates were cleared in Plymouth, Massachusetts. At least 100 people came to dinner. If you cooked for a crowd this year, take comfort in the fact that more than 100 people were in attendance that first Thanksgiving, and they didn't even have running water, never mind a dishwasher. At least 90 Native men and 50 Englishmen came to the feast. Plymouth Plantation Colonial Foodways culinary expert Kathleen Wall told the Times, the native people dined sitting on the ground like they did at home, and the English ate at the table like they did at theirs. The group likely played markmanship games and ran foot races in between dining on venison, geese, turkey, and other fowl. The festivities lasted three days, since it took the Wampognauga a solid two weeks to walk there. So yes, overnight holiday guests are deeply rooted in the Thanksgiving tradition. The Native American leader brokered peace 
That leader was named Massasoit, first negotiated a treaty between the Plymouth Setters and the tribe in 1620, which included an agreement that no member of either group would harm anyone from the other group. They also pledged to leave their weapons at home when trading to further ensure peaceful commerce. And for about 10 years, Massasoit and the Pilgrims remained allies, trading English goods for Wampanoag land, access to natural resources, and other assets. But after the leader passed away in 1661 and his son Wamsuta took over, tensions began to simmer. In the years between 1630 and 42 alone, about 25,000 European colonizers arrived while a devastating plague decimated the native population by more than half. Wamsuta himself died mysteriously in 1662 while visiting the Puritans to talk over gathering unrest between the two groups. His successor, Metacomet, only fanned the flames. In 1675, three natives were executed after killing a man who had served as a translator to the settlers, which only further engendered distrust between the two groups. Metacomet feared the natives would lose more land to new arrivals and built a coalition of various native tribes to protect themselves and their resources. By the autumn of 1675, the coalition members began to clash with settlers, attacking settlements in Connecticut and Massachusetts. The Narragansett tribe originally wanted to remain neutral, but wouldn't give up Wampunaga tribes who had taken refuge in their encampment, or turn away women, children, and the elderly infirmed from that tribe who came to them seeking shelter from the conflict. As a result, Puritans attacked that stronghold. And in the bloody battle and its aftermath, 600 natives and 150 settlers died. That conflict further devastated native populations. And what was later known as the King Philip's War ensued. It was so named after Metacomet's English moniker. The subsequent conflicts deeply impacted both the native tribes and the colonies. Wampanoag abducted settlers and held them ransom. While well, settlers pillaged and destroyed native villages, much of the colonies was burned and looted, taking decades to fully recover. An article in the Historical Journal of Massachusetts said the war could have claimed as many as 30% of the English population and half of the Native Americans then living in what's now New England. The war officially ended when Metacomet was killed, beheaded, and dismembered, according to It Happened in Rhode Island. His remaining allies were executed or sold into slavery in the West Indies. The colonists impaled King Philip's head on a spike and displayed it in Plymouth for 25 years as in a macabre effigy to the strife. Of course, King Philip's war wasn't the last or only conflict between native peoples and the colonizers. Other battles raged in Virginia, Connecticut, New York, and elsewhere, and the Native American population has never really recovered. For the thriving societies that were already living in what's now the United States when the Europeans arrived, the settlers' arrival wasn't the beginning of a new world, but the end of one. For that reason, Native Americans and their allies have gathered at noon on Thanksgiving Day at Coles Hill in Plymouth to commemorate a national day of mourning since 1970. Participants in the National Day of Mourning honor Native ancestors and the struggles of indigenous peoples to survive here today. 
It's a day dedicated to remembrance, spiritual connection, and the struggle um, and uh, the protest against racism, genocide, and the oppression that Native Americans have suffered and continue to suffer today. Thus, Liz Schumer ends her history. Perhaps on a more positive note, Brian Mosquita Weedon, chairman of the Mashpee Wapunagaga Tribal Council, said on Boston Public Radio earlier this week that Americans owe his tribe a debt of gratitude for helping the pilgrims survive that first brutal winter. And he said, quote, people need to understand that you need to be thankful each and every day. That was how our ancestors thought and navigated this world. Because we were thankful, he said, we were willing to share, and we had good intentions and a good heart. That wasn't reciprocated over the long term, Whedon added. That's why 400 years later, we're still fighting here, fighting for what little bit of land we still have and trying to hold the Commonwealth and the federal government accountable, he said, because 400 years later, we don't really have much to show for or to be thankful for. So I think it's important for everyone to be thankful for our ancestors who helped the pilgrims survive and played an intricate role in the birth of this nation. As Sue Chambers extinguishes the sanctuary chalice, please extinguish your chalice at home and say these words with me. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again.